colleagues, that's for sure. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, any questions, logistics, uh, before I start moving forward? Any questions? Okay, all right. Well, let's see if this is gonna work. Probably not. Okay, so that's not gonna work. Well, nothing's working. There we go. So w w whenever we talk about microfluidics, the first thing we always like to kind of show you is a sense of scale. So what in the heck does microfluidics mean? Okay, the fluid part is pretty straightforward, right? You're shuttling fluids. Micro means you're shuttling fluids through micrometer domains. And this is a great slide here because it's just kind of giving you an idea of what kind of scales in terms of length that we're talking about. And typically we're not talking about the total length of any fluidic via. We're talking about its cross section, its depth and its width. And uh, for microfluidics, channels that are anywhere from about 100 nanometers up to several micrometers or millimeters in size, is kind of under the domain of microfluidics. And then we're also gonna be talking about nanofluidics. And this is kind of interesting, because guess what? Anything below 100 nanometers, things change dramatically. What do I mean by that? How you make it changes. And then the, with the fluids that you transport through nanometer domains, that changes too. So that's kind of a, that's why that demarcation line at 100 nanometers is, is kind of a, it's put there based upon physical reasons, both from the manufacturing or the making it perspective and the fluids that you transport under, uh, uh, that are less than 100 nanometers in size. So it's, it's always a fair assessment to figure out what microfluidics buys you, what can it do? Um, I think the easiest one, you know, the one that you'll always hear is, well, it's small. It shrinks the experiment that you need to do. Yeah, maybe so. I, I don't put that much stock in that. I, I think what's really attractive is that the automation. So processing steps that you may have in any assay that you're trying to transition on or microfluidic, you can automate that. And guess what? Whenever you automate something that is fluid dispensing, piping or whatever, all of those become much better controlled when you're using microfluidics versus someone there pipetting, the variability in the assay goes down precipitously. You get better control of experimental conditions. And I was talking to Aaron about reaction times and those can be carefully controlled by using microfluidics and then adding processing steps. So everything is well controlled. The variability on the assays are gonna be much more uh, lower than if you did this by hand, that's for sure. And of course, you reduce the amount of uh, operator uh, that you need in order to carry out an assay. In many cases, you can do process, reduce processing time. And in some cases, that can be extremely important. Reduce waste generation and reduce sample and reagent consumption as well. And with tight budgets in the research domain, that's extremely important. It's better to use a microliter of uh, expensive reagent than one liter of reagent. I don't think anyone will disagree with me uh, on that. And you'll see plenty of examples of microfluidic devices. And the, the, there is some challenges with any microfluidic endeavor, that's for sure. And one of them is how to manufacture or produce the device. That's always a pervasive is issue because in many cases it requires heavy infrastructure. And you're gonna see that this afternoon. I mean, I'll be the first to admit, there's a lot of expensive toys in the rooms that we're gonna go in. Uh, but the advantage is that you don't have to produce that infrastructure in your own lab. You can actually use existing resources like coming here to use a lot of the sophisticated equipment that we have to do any type of an experiment that you so endeavor. Well, I put here the relatively high cost. But, can, but that's becoming less of an issue if you know what you're doing. And that's one of the things that we're gonna to try to do for you. 
is actually tell you how you can make microfluidic devices in a very cost-effective manner. So that's one thing that we're going to be, be talking to you about. Uh, difficult to interface to the macro world. Oh, gosh, that's exactly right. I mean, if you only require one picoliter of reagent, there's no way for a particular reaction, whatever you're doing, there's no way you can pipette one microliter or picoliter. Can anyone do that? No. I, uh, so there's a challenge there, but, but the interfacing to the macro world is, is again a challenge. And we'll, I can discuss some things that we're doing on that, on that and uh, ameliorate that problem. Well, detection can be problematic. So let's say you have a mass spectrometer and it can detect an atom mole of material. But the microfluidic only requires three orders of magnitude. It can only accommodate three orders of magnitude less material. You have a problem, right? Because the mass of material you're putting into the analysis platform can't be detected by the readout. Whatever that is, it's not just mass spec, it's anything. So that's another thing that you, you need to pay special attention to. And the last one we were talking about this morning as well, mixing is difficult. But, and there's a reason for that, and I have a slide to show you what that is. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But there's ways to get around that too. Yeah, one more comment too is microfluidics is challenging because you have to have the right application. You need to understand the, flu the fluid dynamics, how fluids are transported. You need to have someone on board that can help you make it, choose the right material, modify the material property. You're already seeing the challenge with this whole adventure is you need different levels of expertise. People who, engineers who know how to make it, process engineers, material scientists understand material properties, the fluid dynamics people, and then the right people to drive the application. And to tell you, uh, does it make sense to move this assay to a microfluidic platform? And, and I would not stand up here and tell you everything should go to microfluidics. That may not be the case at all. So you have to judiciously choose what you need to transition into a microfluidic or even a nanofluidic uh, domain. That's for sure. Hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> this whole area is growing immensely. There's just no doubt about that for a lot of the reasons that I delineated on the previous slide. But boy, um, you know, there's many, many applications. Uh, <clears throat> miniaturized analytical systems for doing in vitro diagnostics, drug discovery, environmental testing, all sorts of things. <clears throat> Biomedical devices, implantable devices for orthopedics, for example. I know a couple people here at KU that's working on orthopedic devices. Tools for chemistry and, biology, and biochemistry, small-scale synthesis sample preparation, tools for fundamental research, a whole slew of different application scenarios. And just like I alluded to, don't be fooled. Everything that you may be working on or plan to work on may not be appropriate for a microfluidic system. So just keep that in mind as you start moving forward. But that's part of our job here over the next couple of days is to kind of give you an, a sense of, or an idea of what is appropriate or not appropriate to put on a microfluidic platform. And then what, what are some design considerations that you need to think about in order to make that a smooth transition from the bench top into a microfluidic. Yeah, and the purpose of this slide is just to show you the wealth of things that you can make and I, and I think, don't be misled by this name, microfluidics, meaning all you can do is make channels to transport fluids. That's not at all the case. There's a, you can make micro optical units. Um, you, don't have any, you, you can pattern nanostructures. Uh, uh, you can, again, here is where, where we have uh, pillars to do solid phase extractions. 
uh, you can pattern, and this is the other thing too, this is a nice picture here, because it's showing you in some cases, we have to make electrical connections to these fluidic channels, and you can do that too. And a lot of that can be done in a fabrication protocol that's gonna be conducive to high scale production at low cost. And just depending upon the nature of the experiment that you wish to endeavor, you know, you know, maybe you want these things to be extremely low cost to accommodate a disposable application. That means it runs one sample and you throw the device away. So in some cases that may be necessary to do. Um, yeah, let's see, oh gosh, different materials, silicon, plastic, uh, you can insert fiber optics into these devices. You can make micro optical components. Here's a micro mirror in this particular microfluidic. Uh, some variety of materials, variety of structures, pattern electrodes. You're going to hear all about that over the next couple days, how that's done actually. And, and you'll hear a really nice talk, I think tomorrow, uh, tomorrow on commercial microfluidic devices. So in some cases, for an application that you may envision, you don't have to make it yourself. You might be able to commercially purchase that microfluidic. And that's another thing that you'll hear about what, what, uh, what you can get from commercial vendors already. And for example, in our lab, we do droplet digital PCR uh, to look at nucleic acids and this is done using a microfluidic to make these small droplets here where you do chemical reactions in. There's another company that is, sells devices that can be mass produced using injection molding, which Professor Park will tell you about. And these are to isolate rare cells. So there's a variety of F examples of where microfluidics is already percolated into the commercial domain. Yeah, the, okay, so there's a lot of information on this and I'm not gonna spend the time to go through this. You, you, everyone has these slides on the little sticks that you have. Uh, that'll let you go back and look, look at these, the content that we're talking about. And then if you ever have questions on any of this material, you can come right back to us. You have our contact information and we can share that with you. But what you want to, what you should get out of this slide at this point is this. Think about how many devices you need for a particular application. If you need thousands and thousands and thousands using PDMS and soft lithography, which you're going to hear about, may not be the way to go. It may be more efficient to do injection molding, where when you're making only a few pieces, it's not very cost effective but it becomes more cost effective if you're scaling up the number of chips. And this is exactly what happens in many commercial applications. They'll look at these curves and decide what is the fabrication modality that needs to be done in order to accommodate, accommodate that particular market area. All right, and we can, we, we, I'll be happy to go through how all of these things come into play and what all these terms mean in terms of look, estimating the cost per device. So, wow, lots of tools, lots of stuff going on here. Uh, this is, uh, these are some of the things that we have at KU to do microfluidics. And I should point out, make nanostructures to do as well, to do nanofluidics. So uh, let me just point out a couple things here. This is what's called a high precision mill, micro milling. Uh, Matt, Dr. Matt Hubert will be talking about that. It spins very small bits, 50 micron carbide bits at very high uh, revolutions, 50,000 or so, still can make extremely small holes. The holes here, is, it can make structures as small as 20 microns. And what is going on here is they're making what's called molding tools. So you can see these raised structures in this brass. That can be transferred over into what's called a hot embossing machine. So these structures get transferred over to a plastic to make the final device or any other material, it doesn't need to be a plastic, to realize this microfluidic you know, medium scale production mode. Um, I'm going to come back to this. 
then that can be scaled up to injection mold. And we'll show you quickly what this looks like, this machine. This is for very high scale that can make many, many parts. Uh, then the clean room, we'll be going through that this afternoon as well. The clean room is exactly what the name implies. It's clean. <laughs> so what does that mean? The particulates in air uh, are extremely controlled and low. That's because if you have dust, there's all sorts of things floating around in, in the uh, air here. If those particulates land, they're a micron, several tens of microns in size, they land on your workpiece, guess what? You're gonna have a problem when you're doing some of the processing steps, whatever that is. And I'm using that pretty generically because of the simple fact that we're gonna hear more about that. That's what the optical lithography part of uh, making this. So, so a lot of these structures, the, mo the method that you choose to make these stu structures is predicated on the size that you need. So if you want something about 20 to 30 microns in size, you can very well use this machine here. If you need something much smaller, then you need to go over to this fabrication modality. It's called lithography. And you can make structures maybe about a half micron in size using optical lithography. So I know, don't fret. I know a lot of you are saying, what in the world is that? Okay, we're going to talk about that. You're going to hear about what optical lithography is. And you're going to hear about this micro machining too. This will just kind of get you uh, familiar with the type of techniques that you'll hear about. So the ph photolithography is right here. There's a reason that this has a yellow light in it. That's because you're working with sensitive materials, light sensitive materials. Uh, so that's why this yellow light is here. There's a nano imprinting tool. You'll see that as well. And you'll see a demonstration on that. Uh, and then etching and deposition. Uh, so I'll be talking about that a little later this morning. Okay, so I have a couple minutes left and I, I just wanted to keep you acquainted and familiar with the idea that things in a microfluidic device are different than what you see in the bent, at the bench top. They're different. And this kind of summarizes that. Uh, one is at least one characteristic dimension in the micron range. I said 0.1 to about 100 microns. That's intrinsically true. So let's just think about that. What happens when you're in that size domain? That means a characteristic length means either the width or the depth of the channel is 0.1 to 100 microns. Well, when you're below a micron, new fluid dynamics happen. And we're not gonna talk about that but I'll be happy if you want to sit down and talk about that. I'll be happy to sit and discuss that with you uh, as well. Surface tension is dominant. Uh, that's not too surprising because the surface to volume ratio is high. So the surfaces are going to have a profound impact on pushing or transporting liquids, many of them are aqueous, through these microchannels. Uh, inertia has low effects, that's for sure, and gravity has minor importance in, in, in these microfluidic in, environments. This is an extremely important one. Mixing is due to diffusion, mainly, not due to convection, because the Reynolds number is low. The Reynolds number is low. But there are some interesting things that you can do and make in microchannels to make mixing occur on a very fast time scale. And I don't think we'll be talking about that, but that's another, during lunch, we'll have time for discussions, uh, go meet as a group. We can all talk about these type of concepts. What can be done to facilitate mixing? That's, uh, that's there's things that you can do in terms of the architecture of the channel to facilitate that. And they're pretty straight to do. You can, you can use electrokinetic or hydrodynamic flows. No problem there. That means you drive the fluid electrically, like electrophoresis, or you drive it with pressure, like a syringe pump. Um, and fast heat transfer, due to the fact that you have small distances. So you can heat and cool things very rapidly uh, using a microfluidic uh, environment. And the, Final thing is a high surface to volume ratio. 
So you have to be careful. While the diffusional distances are small, what problem, the problem you may have is things will stick to the wall. They're very close to the wall. That means you can lose material because of what's called nonspecific adsorption to the wall. That means you have to look at the wall and engineer the surface properties to mitigate that issue. And there's very simple ways to do Okay, I better be careful. I always get yelled at because I always say things are simple. There's things that you can do to address that issue, uh, nonspecific adsorption artifacts. <clears throat> and gosh, this is kind of an interesting slide because this is showing you integrated systems. That is, we can do multi-step assays on integrated systems to carry out complex measurements on either uh, genetic material or proteomic material. Uh, here's a two-dimensional electrophoresis of peptides that are generated from certain proteins that have been proteolytically digested, and then taking small amounts of nucleic acids and doing various processing steps on them, doing ligation assays, PCR reactions, solid phase extraction, and then reading those results out using a, a microarray. So all of these can be integrated into a microfluidic platform, even those that carry out multi-step acids. So <clears throat> finally, these are just some things that you're going to uh, get a chance to learn about over the next couple of days. How to make it, fabrication techniques, micrometer versus nanometer patterning. Uh, how do you inspect the structures? You can't just look at them, especially in their nanometer domain. There has to be special techniques for you to do that. And then materials. What kind of materials? PDMS, elastomers, thermoplastics, ceramics, silicon, glass, all sorts of different materials. And then how to use it. What are some of the things that you can use these microfluidics for? And actually the experiment that you'll be working on is building a microculture counter to count single cells. And, at the, and here we'll be making this out of a thermoplastic. So you'll be using hot embossing in order to do that. So we have the machines here to let you get that opportunity to do that. Okay, any quick questions before we move on to the next part of this morning's presentations? Any questions? Okay, so if you think of questions, you, you know, again, these are things that we can talk about during the break or um, during lunch. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Matt Hubert, and he's going to be talking about micromachining using non-optical techniques.